Kia ora, good evening. Welcome to Central News for Monday, the 10th of March. I'm Hilary Entwistle. This weekend, we'll see upwards of 70 riders representing the 11 regional cycling centres around New Zealand competing to be national champions in game selection for August Glasgow Commonwealth Games. Rushley Buchanan has already tasted success with a bronze in the team pursuit at the 2010 UCI Track Cycling World Champs and was a member of the New Zealand team at the 2012 Summer Olympics. She has her sights set high for this weekend's Track Champs. It's going to be an amazing experience to start with, but um, yeah, I've always got high expectations for nationals and coming off a win in the road nationals, you know, I'd like to put my hand up again and, and get another national title. Um, just one would be awesome, but I'm racing in five different races and so just want to do the best in every single one. Waikato District Health Board Chief Executive Craig Klimo claims there are no excuses now. Hamilton City Council should put fluoride back in the city's water supply. South Taranaki District Council decision to fluoridate Pātia and Waverley's water supplies stands and now Hamilton health professionals want their council to put fluoride back in their water immediately. Anti-fluoridation group New Health has failed in its challenge of South Taranaki District Council's decision to fluoridate the town's water supplies. The High Court judgment was made on Friday by Justice Rodney Hanson. A good-sized crowd of interested spectators took advantage of the beautiful Bay of Plenty autumn weather to catch the last two games of the White Ferns vs West Indies five-match T20 series at the Bay Oval. In Game 4 on Saturday, the New Zealand team were looking to lock up the T20 series. While well, opener Keisha Knight made a determined start and went on to score 28 runs, the visitors were in trouble at 21 for three. The arrival of Shemaine Campbell, who top scored with 29, turned the tide and produced a spirited partnership with Keisha Knight. However, when Campbell was caught off the bowling of Nicola Brown, the White Ferns were in charge and went on to restrict the Caribbean side to 99 for seven. Morna Nielsen and Susie Bates grabbed two wickets apiece. The White Ferns victory was a walk in the park with opener Susie Bates leading the charge with a polished half century. The 19-year-old Makatu man charged with murder following the fatal shooting of a 46-year-old man in the Bay of Plenty town is heading to trial. Tyrone Daniel Flavel had his case heard before Justice Lang in Tauranga District Court today. He previously pleaded not guilty to one count of murder on December the 16th last year. Makatu man Isaac Dale Bushell was found dead with a bullet wound in a park at uh, the Beach Road early on December the 8th, 2013. Police say the 46-year-old victim and the accused were known to each other and had been at the same party in Makatu earlier on the Saturday night. Now for our region's marine forecast. Raglan West Coast, moderate southwest swell easing early tomorrow morning with a variable 10 knots. Your high tide is at 7.19am and 7.41pm. East Coast Bay of Plenty, southeast 10 knots, becoming northerly 15 knots in the afternoon, easing to 10 knots in the evening with a slight sea. Your high tide is at 10 past 4 in the afternoon. Just to hear being sustainable in your own backyard. Welcome to Central News. This is the ninth year of the Enviro Hub Sustainable Backyard Month and there are over 70 events in the Western Bay of Plenty this March. So, what is the aim of it all? Sustainable Backyards um, has been organised by Enviro Hub Bay of Plenty for the last nine years. Um, next year will be our 10th anniversary and it was originally organised to bring together um, environmental groups, um, non-profits, uh, and local communities and really get them engaged in, um, in the environment and building sustainable communities. Are you seeing an increase in those wanting to become more sustainable? Yes I am. I'm finding that there's a really big interest from the local public in any workshops to do with gardening, um, being sustainable, having, having your own vegetable garden as well as solar power and things along those lines and also getting out into nature and becoming closer, getting closer with your neighbours and getting to know your community. Um, 
we've got 70 events this year, which is a record. Um, it's the 10th year we've been running and um, it's growing and growing, so it's great. This year you guys are holding a bit of a festival at the village. Yes, we're holding our inaugural EnviroFest day. So we're planning on making this an annual event. It's going to be a family fun day of workshops um, on sustainability, everything from worm farming through to um, having a solar panel through to eating healthy on a budget. We've got Chef Peter Peter Blakeway coming down and doing a cooking demonstration. Um, and we have heaps of uh, local non-profits and um, environmental groups who are showcasing what they do. Lots of activities for kids to keep them busy and really good food um, and we're trying to make it a zero waste event so we are going to be composting um, all the food materials and all the stall holders are in, um, being basically forced to use um, compostable materials for their, um, for their food beverages. It's not just about gardening, you guys have got an art challenge as well. Can you tell me about that? Yes, this year we were really keen to get uh, young people involved. So we have a sustainable art challenge for high school and intermediate age children. Uh, we've got some amazing pieces being created. There's four categories, upcycling old junk like pallets and other um, business waste, um, waste <laughs> into new furniture. So we've got kids making um, outdoor furniture out of pallets. Um, trash to fish, film and, sh and photography. And the month coincides with Earth Hour, so what are you guys going to do for that? For Earth Hour, uh, Tauranga City Council are organising a off-the-grid um, gourmet night market at Coronation Park at the Mount. And um, Mau Our Performing Arts Centre will be there as well. So it's going to be a power-free event. We are going along um, with the EnviroHub cycle powered smoothie machine and we're going to be making uh, cycle powered smoothies for the public um, on the night to, um, to push the, the no power message. So it should be a great night. You can view the EnviroHub Sustainable Backyard Month calendar of events on their Facebook page or at envirohub.org.nz. The Avanti Drome in Cambridge is due to open soon and has attracted many elite riders to the area. Amory spoke with the Avanti Drone Business Development Manager, Nikki Martin, who explained that the public will have access to the track 75% of the time. Nikki, welcome to Central News. Thank you. The Avanti Drone, it really is a facility for everyone, isn't it? Definitely. I mean, that's our mantra. Our mantra we have is no bike, no helmet, no lycra, no problem. No lycra. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> that's no problem. No. Tell me about that mantra. How does it work? So one of the big issues that, or one of the big issues people talk to us about is, well, it's a track and we need a track bike. We need a special bike. Um, and they are a special bike to go on the track. You can't turn up with your mountain bike or your road bike. You need to be on a, a specific track bike and they cost a lot of money. So we've gone and ordered 100 community bikes that people can turn up and use our, our bikes. The next thing people say is, well, I don't have a helmet. That's fine because we've got 100 helmets that people can use. And then the next excuse usually is, oh, I don't like wearing lycra. And that's totally fine. We say there's, if you want to wear lycra, that's fine. But if you don't want to wear lycra, that's great. So you could just turn up in shorts and a T-shirt? Shorts and T-shirts. So I rode the velodrome two days ago in denim shorts, Converse shirts, uh, shoes and just a T-shirt and had a ball of a time and it was brilliant. Is there an age requirement? So the minimum age to go on the track is 10, and that's really just a health and safety factor. Um, and kids at that age really are beginning to get a lot stronger and also bike skills as well, just so that they're more stable on a bike. But no, and then we say up to 110. So I've actually got somebody uh, who's booked their 80th birthday party with us later this year, and he actually tried out for the Olympic New Zealand team uh, in his 30s, and he's really keen to get back and have a go on the bike himself. It's fantastic. Yep. You do cater for the under 10s though as well. You've got a mum and tots program. Definitely. It sounds amazing. It is. Well, as a mum myself, I just remember back to those days when my kids were under five and I really wanted to exercise but couldn't because I'd got nowhere for my under fives to go. 
Um, so what we've actually done again is looked at the barriers. So if you're a mom, dad, aunt, uncle, or carer of an under five, you can come into the velodrome. We'll have a pump track or an obstacle course in the infield. So the carer can go and have an hour on the track with the instructor, while the under five has their own fun learning really important bike skills on the infield with another instructor. My son's really excited to hear that birthday parties are going to be held yeah. at the Avanti Drome. Tell me about that. So again, it's such a great facility for the community that we really want people to be able to use it as widely as possible. And so we're sort of aiming to take on the laser tags and the bowling. It's another idea for a birthday party. So from as little as $15 per person per hour, we can cater for a birthday party as long as they're 10 years old. And they can come on the track for an hour. We provide the bike and the helmet and an instructor. And they have an hour of fun on the track. And then there's two options. They can either go into our function room rooms and have the birthday party. We can supply the birthday cake and all the food and, and the drink. Otherwise, we have the cafe on site that you could then go into for the rest of the birthday party. Brilliant. It's Nikki. going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. Thank you very much. If you'd like to experience track cycling, go to avantijome.co.nz. Coming up next, the debt of Rokai. Welcome back. Route K is a five kilometre two lane tolled expressway that links Tauranga city centre, the port and Mount Monganui with state highways 29 and 36 to the southwest. It is an extension of Takatimu Drive, which is state highway two, and is part of Tauranga's strategic roading network. The New Zealand Transport Agency has finally agreed to take over and by 2015 the road will be a state highway. The current debt of the road is around $63 million. I found out from Mayor Stuart Crosby if the debt will remain with the council. Well, I think it's good news. Uh, NZT are proposed to take the road over from a physical perspective and also take the risk out of the funding of it. In other words, they'll pay us a set amounts every year, so that gives us certainty around our funding. They're also going to put up our electronic uh, easy flow uh, toll uh, facility, so you don't have to stop and actually hand money over. Uh, so that's new technology that will be here, Northern Gateway and our new Tarangit Eastern Arterial. Uh, but so in the long term we now have certainty of funding and so whilst the debt on Route K was always paid by the users, not the ratepayers, we need to make that quite clear, the ratepayers were guaranteeing it. Now we basically have guaranteed funding so that's in my view a significant step forward in reducing the risk to Tarangit City Council. Will that be like the Northern Gateway, the electronic systems? Yes, and if people have travelled to Melbourne or other parts in Australia, you simply just drive past and it's number plate recognition uh, and you have various methodologies of paying uh, a few days after you've used the toll road. And who will pay for putting in that new system? NZTA are going to pay for that uh, on their own, so it won't be added to uh, the toll debt. It'll be a separate project altogether. The debt is about $63 million. How are you going to ensure that the council has paid that debt back? Well it was being uh, what we call capitalised so there is a period of time where the debt does grow uh, then it hits a certain point and then it will be reduced so it has been paid back by the users and we're going to put the toll up from $1.50 for our cars to $2. Now that's been um, planned for some time uh, and also the heavy truck movements, uh, their toll will go up a small proportion as well. Theirs hasn't gone up for over a decade, so the revenue will come from the tolls. In your eyes, has Road K been a success? Well, I'd answer that by saying let's close it and see what happens. There'll be congestion on Cameron Road, Moffat Road, Cambridge Road, it'll be chaos. So yes it has, and people need to understand these um, pieces of infrastructure are for the long term. So there's often a, a short period of pain, financial pain, but there is a longer term gain and it's hard for some people to understand that, um, to look ahead 20, 30, 40, 50 years ahead. And it's been um, a major contribution to the ease of traffic out, in and out of the port of Tauranga. Why did it take so long for the NZT, NZTA to take over? Well they see it as a critical part of the state highway network now. When it was initially built it wasn't. 
but clearly with their improvements um, on the various state highways. And what we're building is a ring road around Taronga, four lane ring road, of which Route K is a part of it. And they see that as now an integral part of their network, so hence our conversations with them over a period of time uh, for them to basically take it over. To keep up to date with all things council, visit their website, tauranga.gov.nz. The Girl on the Swing opened in Hamilton in January, selling cupcakes, cakes and fudge. Anne-Marie spoke with owner Ange Jones about her dream that has become a very busy reality and shows no signs of slowing down. So my niece Kyla was turning 10 and she's pretty lucky because she's a person who doesn't really need anything or want for anything. So I came to the decision that I was going to do this for her because there was nothing that I could buy her that would blow her out of the water. So basically I created this blue themed table for her with biscuits and cakes and candy floss and things like that. And just her response when she walked in because she knew I was doing it but had no idea what it would look like. And she came in and she started crying and then I was crying and her mum was crying and even her dad was impressed. So that's when I realised if a boy can be impressed by this, then I was on to a winner. Owning your own business was always a dream for you. Tell me the story behind The Girl on the Swing. So when I was a little girl, I was probably about five or six, my father built me a swing and that was my favourite thing to do, being on a swing and just swinging and daydreaming. And at that stage, my parents decided to separate and I took a look at my life and my friends' lives and all of my friends that were happy and whose parents were happy, their parents owned their own company and or worked for themselves. So I naturally thought being a six-year-old and not knowing anything, that if you owned your own company, that your family life and you would be happy. So the little girl on the swing used to dream every day of what she could do to make herself and others happy. And you found that through cupcakes? Yeah. Tell me about the support you've had from family and friends. So my biggest support has been my husband Steve and my sister Janine. Janine came from an accounting background and she'd been in the same job for 17 years and she has been my rock. I would go to her my whole life and say, I've got this business idea, and she'd come back to me and she'd say, no, that's terrible, you can't do it. And I'd say, I've got this other one, and she'd go, no, you can't do that. And then I'd say one, and she'd be like, oh, it might work. But this was the one that I came to her and I said, what do you think of this idea? And she said, it's brilliant, it's gonna work. And I looked at her and I said, I can only do it if you come with me. And so she's my business partner and my best friend, and I couldn't do it without her. She's been fantastic. Have you always been a baker? I, I've always loved baking, and I, at, when I left school, I, my first ever job was in a bakery, um, but then I went into retail and sales and marketing. But my mum was a baker, and a very good baker. I remember going to school and sharing all my baking with my friends in the class. There's been a lot in the media lately regarding obesity, nutrition and sugar, yet your shop is bucking that trend and remaining very popular. Why do you think that is? I, I believe the cupcakes are popular for a couple of reasons. One is because of the moderation, so it's a smaller item, so you can cut it up and share it with friends and family. The other thing is with cupcakes, you can buy individual cupcakes. So if you've got a shout for somebody and someone is gluten free or dairy intolerant, someone likes chocolate and somebody doesn't, you can get different cupcakes to, to please everybody, basically. Coming up next, your weather for Tuesday and who is the best volunteer? Welcome back to Central News. Are you a volunteer or do you know anyone who does an outstanding job of giving up their time to a worthy cause? Well, you can nominate them for the Waikato Volunteer Excellence Award. Welcome to the program, Heather. Thank you. Now, let's start at the beginning. What is volunteering Waikato? So volunteering Waikato is a community organisation. Uh, we have two main aims. So the first aim is that we find volunteers for other community organisations or charities right around the region. Uh, the second part of that is that anyone who wants to volunteer can come to us either into our centre or register online and we provide a choice of 
a, a wide choice of volunteering opportunities. At any one time we have about 250 different volunteering roles available. It's a lot of volunteers. Yes, it is. <laughs> so what are the values behind the organisation? Mm, for us, um, we believe that everybody can make a meaningful contribution in their community. Um, of course, we certainly value the uh, volunteer effort. Um, we know that all of our communities are heavily reliant uh, on volunteers. Uh, and last year, 2,600 people volunteered through our service. So we're glad that other people see that as well. That is a lot of people volunteering. Mm. That's, oh wow, that's quite amazing. It sounds like the Waikato has definitely got a big heart. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and those people applied for about 3,500 different positions with our member organisations. We work with 280 community organisations in the region. Now that's a lot of people to choose one special person, but you do have uh, the Volunteer Excellence Award and nominations are open now. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, so the, the Volunteer Excellence Awards are an annual event. They're held in uh, National Volunteer Week in June. So the nominations are now open and they, they close on Monday the 14th of April. So any organisation can nominate um, volunteers for the three categories. So we have the Volunteer of the Year Award, we have the Volunteer of the Year Youth Award, so for any volunteer under 25, and we also have a Team Excellence Award, where you can nominate a whole team of volunteers who are working together to do something. So what kind of uh, team volunteers are there out there? I kind of think of most volunteers to be kind of team volunteers. Yeah, well, last year the team that won the Team Excellence Award were the St John Thames Health Shuttle Drivers. So it could be any team. Um, my role prior to working for Volunteering Waikato, I uh, worked for Lifeline. And on three occasions <laughs> over my time there, I nominated the team of telephone counsellors. So sometimes it's hard to pick, when you've got a team of volunteers, hard to pick one that's outstanding. So you can nominate the whole team. So how can we nominate? Uh, the Volunteering Waikato website, which is volunteeringwaikato.org.nz, um, if people go to the website, they can nominate online. They can download a nomination pack if they would rather actually fill in a nomination form. And they can contact our office and we can post out a form if they would rather. The closing date for nominations is on Monday, April the 14th. You can nominate by visiting volunteeringwaikato.org.nz. Now for our region's weather for Tuesday. Hamilton, fine with light winds. Your expected high is 26 and an overnight low of 11. Paeroa, you will have long fine spells with a high of 24 and an overnight low of 13. Much of the same for you, 23 and 13. Tsiao Mutu, the same for you, but it will be a bit warmer for you, 26 and 11. And Tokoroa, the same again, long fine spells with an expected high of 24 and an overnight low of 11. The Bay of Plenty, Tauranga fine with sea breezes, your expected high is 23 and an overnight low of 15. And the same for you, Tupuki, but a smidge cooler with 22 and 12 for your overnight low. That's Central News for tonight. Like us on our Facebook page or email us at news at tvcentral.co.nz and let us know if you have something you would like us to cover. Join me again tomorrow night for more stories from the Waikato and the Bay of Plenty. I'm Hilary Entwistle. I hope you have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.